And so uh, start with a little bit of an overview on DKNet. Um, it is funded by uh, NIH, by the National Institute of Diabetes and Dig Digestive and Kidney Diseases. And it really is uh, meant to be a, a research resource portal for uh, you know, biomedical researchers, for uh, uh, clinical researchers as well, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, students and the like. Um, and really, uh, it's meant to be a way to connect, uh, you know, these, uh, these researchers uh, and NIH-funded centers uh, to resources that they may not be aware of. Um, and it is maintained uh, by uh, our laboratory at the University of California, San Diego, uh, and that is uh, run by uh, Marianne Martone and uh, myself. So who is uh, DKNet's target audience? Uh, really, uh, you know, since we're funded by NIDDK, our primary audience is basic and clinical researchers in diabetes, digestive, obesity, endocrine, Metabol metabolic, kidney, uro urologic, nutrition, bone, and blood diseases, really the, the whole uh, uh, gamut of what NIDDK covers. Uh, however, you know, as I already sort of alluded to, the tools and services are relevant across all biomedical domains. Um, and as you'll see when I go through some of the examples later, you know, when we discuss some of the reports, you know, if an antibody is used in something that's specific for NIDDK, you know, it could also be used for something that's specific for you know, cancer research, uh, you know, for neuroscience, uh, you know, and the like. Uh, there are five primary areas in which we are providing uh, information right now, and we will go through uh, each of these areas. Um, but the uh, most important aspect of this is that uh, these different items uh, sort of apply in various aspects of uh, the research process. So as you notice, you know, as one, you know, uh, sort of goes and plans an experiment, constructs hypothesis, uh, you know, collects and analyzes data and publishes the results, um, what we've outlined here are where these various areas can uh, uh, tie in. So for example, um, you know, when you're doing some background research, our discovery portal, which brings together a uh, search across 200 plus different biomedical databases, allows a researcher to go in, you know, and search for information, for data, you know, for funded grants, you know, funding opportunities, uh, literature, tutorials, you know, things that might be needed when one actually, you know, is doing some, uh, some background research. There is the Hypothesis Center, um, which is one of the new areas that we're building out on the site, which can allow people to, uh, interrogate and examine uh, data to help construct hypotheses. You know, when one is actually then planning an experiment based on hypotheses, our resource reports which provide information on specific resources, such as antibodies, tools, and organisms, you know, can be used to help uh, a researcher make a more informed decision, you know, about what resources to use. And then for NIH's uh, uh, rigor and reproducibility, mandates for grant proposals, we can also then use that same information to help provide authentication reports, which provide assistance to researchers, you know, in terms of, you know, what validation methods they should uh, provide. You know, when you're collecting and analyzing data, again, you know, the resource reports might come in useful in terms of finding additional software tools, you know, related to some tools that you're already using in the lab you know, as an example. And then when you publish your results, uh, you know, you need to know, you know, with the new NIH data sharing mandates, you know, that are becoming more rigorous, you know, as, as, as we move forward, um, you know, where should, you know, I publish my data? You know, where can I share my data to meet these NIH, uh, got NIH and NSF guidelines, you know, that are, uh, that are coming out. So the portal itself, uh, you know, when you come to the landing page, you know, these various areas are uh, sort of uh, right there on this, on this front page, grouped into, uh, you know, the various categories, uh, you know, that I, that I went through just now. And, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, we uh, sort of uh, start our tour, we'll start with the resource reports. You know, and really, you know, as, as we mentioned, this is really to, you know, help find and evaluate key research resources. Um, you know, and there are, you know, some questions, you know, that someone might uh, uh, 
need to answer. So for example, if you're publishing a paper, you know, you might be requested for research resource identifier, uh, you know, to cite key resources. And, the, and this uh, section of the portal is what would assist a researcher in doing that. So the research reports uh, are basically uh, built around um, information from a number of community authorities on these resources. So for antibodies, there's an antibody registry where uh, uh, vendors, uh, labs contribute information about their antibodies. Uh, for example, for plasmids, we get this information from AdGene, which is a large uh, uh, a plasmid supplier, you know, for model organisms, there are a number of different databases out there uh, for model organisms that are maintained by the community, such as, you know, Jackson Labs, uh, you know, the rat genome database, uh, Flybase, you know, these are all community-run uh, authorities for specific organisms, and that information is brought into these reports, for example, surrounding organisms. And you know the reports include you know basic information about uh, and and a resource. So in this example, you're seeing information about an antibody, but we also are able to pull out you know who is using them. You know, a lot of times in some of these resources, there's also information about potential issues. Uh, you know, for example, for antibodies, has an antibody been discontinued? Um, is it non-specific? Um, you know, and also how do they compare? So we can basically, you know, use these reports to, you know, assist in, you know, one deciding, uh, you know, is this the appropriate antibody, you know, that I should try? Are there others that people are using? Um, so, for example, within the literature itself, as we track how antibodies are used, we can also see, you know, what other antibodies are used, uh, you know, with this antibody, and also. Since we're getting information from PubMed, um, we can also get information about uh, location. So is anyone near me familiar uh, you know, with this antibody? And this is one of the sort of the newest features for these resource reports that we're starting to test and roll out. Um, and the back of all this uh, information about resources is that you know, by pulling in this information from you know, the, uh, uh, the resource uh, authorities uh, that exist out there, pulling information from the literature, pulling information from other uh, large projects, for example, that do validatings and ratings, you know, such as the Human Protein Atlas and ENCODE, uh, you know, which provide additional information about antibodies. Um, you know, we're able to, you know, assemble this unique data set, you know, which aggregates all this information about these key resources and what ties this all together is uh, the research resource identifiers. So I'm not sure if you've heard about uh, research resource identifiers, um, but they are persistent identifiers for research resources. And so a number of years ago, um, there were, uh, and there still are, I mean, issues in terms of identifying, you know, antibodies, model organisms, uh, you know, in the literature, in that the original way that you know, journals require to report this information, you know, for the majority uh, of the citations for these resources, you know, one could not go back, you know, to, uh, you know, the vendor and find the exact same antibody or organism that was used, you know, just in terms of the way that, uh, you know, it was uh, written in the paper at that time. So this idea of having a unique identifier for these resources um, you know, was, uh, uh, was pitched to the journals, um, and it has now, uh, you know, gained a widespread adoption. Uh, we were one of the, uh, groups that was instrumental in development and adoption of these RIDs, and it really is, you know, for the author then to supply, you know, and identify the exact resource, you know, in the materials and methods section, you know, in terms of what they used. And this is now also incorporated, for example, in Cell Press's STAR methods, uh, you know, which are uh, enhanced uh, methods reporting requirements, you know, for, uh, you know, identification, you know, of, uh, you know, what was used uh, in the paper. And again, you know, the main uh, uh, reason that this was done was, you know, to answer what resources were used in the study, but also who else has published, you know, with this resource. 
and makes then, you know, tracking, you know, of, you know, the antibody, seeing who else has used it, uh, you know, much easier. Or, you know, one of the key things in, te in terms of having an RID to actually specifically identify our resources that we're able to pull resource ratings and alerts. Um, and we're able to aggregate that information. So for example, for cell lines, we can, you know, see if, you know, uh, for example, the, uh, the International Cell Line Authentication Committee, you know, where we're pulling data from, you know, is registering that this is a problematic cell line. Uh, you know, if there's validation information, for example, at the Human Protein Atlas, we can point people to that. Um, you know, if the antibody registry is saying that, you know, the antibody is discontinued, we can give, you know, researchers that alert. So again, you know, provides, you know, we try to provide, you know, not just information, you know, about uh, the basic aspects of these resources, but also uh, potential issues, uh, things that researchers need to be aware of. And that sort of leads us into, uh, you know, the next section, which is the authentication reports that we're providing. So here, you know, when you're planning your experiment, you know, and you want to learn how to identify and, and validate resources, you know, we can use that same information and alert researchers of any issues, you know, with cell lines, you know, and antibodies before the study is, is, is actually performed. Um, you know, so getting earlier in the experimental process, um, and this ties into NIH's rigor reproducibility guidelines where authentication is a key part of this. Um, and the need, you know, for researchers to develop authentication plans that they must set, that they must submit with their proposals. Um, in addition to, um, you know, at the end of a, a, a study, you know, to make your data uh, shareable. Uh, so, you know, this is a, a large area for NIH. In terms of the validation and the uh, uh, authentication plans, you know, we provide authentication reports for cell lines and antibodies that provide information. For example, here what you see is that, you know, there have been a number of, uh, 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 on the left you'll see cell lines, on the top you'll see antibody that has been selected. And, you know, this has, again, in this report that's being prepared for the researcher in terms of, you know, these are things that I plan to use, you know, there is information about, uh, an issue, you know, with that antibody or cell line. Um, and in addition to that, in, in providing that information in the report, we also provide guidance about validation. So there are a number of uh, groups that are providing, you know, best practice information. So what we do is we have aggregated that information, made that available, you know, in these reports. And then as you can see on the left, uh, down the bottom, you know, there's a list of references, you know, for information about where we've gotten this validation information. So basically providing, you know, guidance, uh, assistance in terms of providing uh, this information to NIH. The, uh, you know, the last uh, bit of your experiment is then when, you know, you're, you're, you're needed to uh, share your data and make your data available. I and mean, currently, you know, the, the NIH guidelines, you know, for data sharing are for projects that are uh, greater than uh, $500,000 in terms of direct costs, in terms of mandated sharing. But a lot of RFAs, you know, are mandating data sharing by themselves. And, you know, there is a new data uh, mandate that will be coming out of NIH and more people, you know, uh, are going to be required to, to share their data. But the real issue, you know, is, you know, one, you know, when you're writing your proposal, you need to know how to write, you know, the data management plan. And this is an area where, you know, actually libraries are already very engaged uh, in terms of, uh, you know, providing assistance with data management plans. But then once, you know, you're done with the research, you know, where do you actually find a repository, a repository to share the data? Um, so in terms of uh, FAIR, um, this is a, a a acronym that's been uh, sort of picked up by NIH and NSF, and what it really means is, you know, that data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, right? So that, you know, there's a sort of high-level uh, aspiration as to what the data uh, should be once it is made available to the broader community. And within DKNet, 
we're uh, uh, working to help interpret, you know, these principles, these four principles, you know, for, uh, you know, the uh, DK domains. And in addition to that, then providing tools to assist with that. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the fair data principles, you know, are, are these, you know, four high level principles, you know, uh, to ensure that, you know, once you publish a resource, other users can actually find, you know, that the data is available, that, you know, that users are able to access it in a usable form. And then if people want to uh, take data from different repositories, that they can actually use that data with other data you know, do new analyses, do larger scale analyses. And this is not just for humans, but also machines. Um, so for example, Google uh, goes out and does searches for data sets um, across a number of different uh, repositories, depending on what type of markup uh, these repositories use. And so we also want, you know, the machines to be able to also process this information, you know, and, and to make it then easier uh, to use. So in terms of, uh, you know, what we're doing to assist researchers, you know, the first thing is uh, provide information about data management planning tools. As I mentioned, you know, a number of libraries, you know, groups are already providing, you know, assistance there. So what we're doing, you know, is making sure that, you know, we can link out, you know, to these, uh, you know, various aspects, uh, you know, in terms of preparing a proposal and provi providing uh, information about, uh, you know, the data management aspects of that. But once you've actually, you know, as I completed your uh, experiment, you know, where can one deposit data? And again, this is something that is a little more complex because as I said, you have many different types of repositories that are out there. You know, you have generalist repositories, you know, such as Figshare and Dryad, you know, where anyone can provide data. You know, there are other uh, repositories that are, you know, supported or recommended by NIH institutes. Um, and then there are also repositories that, you know, are, you know, listed, you know, uh, focused on specific scientific disciplines, you know, journals have other recommended lists, you know, so it is a very uh, sort of a, a complex you know, world in terms of determining, you know, where one might go. And so this is where, you know, we're providing uh, you know, based on, you know, our discussions with NIDK, you know, where uh, people should be uh, depositing data, you know, uh, uh, you know, based on, you know, a number of different uh, criteria. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, there are other aspects of uh, the resource, uh, you know, in terms of providing ability to search information across, uh, you know, a large number of different biomedical data repositories. Um, you know, so in terms of doing some, some background re research, and this is our discovery portal. Um, and when one goes to the discovery portal, one can do a simple, <coughs> uh, simple search, and then it returns information in terms of, you know, what category of inf information is it? Is it literature? Is it data? Is it information on funding? Um, is it a f physical resource? And provides then a list of, you know, different uh, data resources, information resources, you know, that one can look at to, uh, uh, you know, find out, uh, you know, if there's any information uh, that one can use. Uh, you know, one of the key things that we're doing is that, you know, within the DK community, we've been aggregating information from, uh, you know, DK specific resources. Uh, you know, so, you know, information, for example, on, you know, with HERN in terms of human islets, you know, the mouse metabolic phenotyping centers, the beta cell consortium uh, and the like. And lastly, one of the, the, the newer areas of the, of the portal is the hypothesis center. Um, and really this is, you know, uh, meant to provide a way for researchers to easily explore, for example, a lot of the omics data that is out there, but do it in a way, you know, uh, where a researcher can do that themselves and doesn't require uh, you know, a lot of bioinformatics expertise to do this uh, exploration. And so the Hypothesis Center, one of the initial uh, uh, tools that we've integrated with this is the, is the Signaling Pathways Project. And this is a knowledge base for cellular signaling pathways. And so, you know, users can go in and uh, what the uh, 
Signaling Pathways Project does is they curate the data uh, coming, for example, out, out of you know, one of the NIH genomics repositories you know, to make the data more fair, you know, as we described earlier. And that allows them to basically provide a, a user interface where investigators, you know, researcher students can, you know, come in with genes of interest, you know, look at receptor families, you know, look at uh, signaling pathways and how, you know, genes in those pathways, you know, are regulated. Um, and uh, so again, this is uh, one of the uh, uh, newer areas, but uh, you know, really, you know, we're looking you know, to provide, you know, tools, you know, such as the Signaling Pathways Project to make it much easier for researchers to get in and explore uh, some of this data to help them, uh, you know, generate new, uh, new hypotheses. Um, so, uh, you know, covered some of the main areas uh, of DKNet. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, sort of summarizing this, you know, we had the resource reports you know, where researchers can uh, use this to help find resources for their research, Research, you know, keeps researchers updated on resources. You know, so if you actually go back, you know, to your uh, authentication reports, you know, if information about an item has changed, for example, let's say a cell line, you know, has been found to have issues after you've started using it, you know, when you come back to your, uh, you know, your report, you know, you'll actually see that it now has uh, a warning. Um, and, uh, you know, also helps, for example, if you're using, you know, a specific model organism, a specific antibody, you know, you want some, uh, you know, uh, information, you know, from potentially from someone else who might have used that antibody, you know, again, you know, uh, we try to also help uh, potentially find collaborators uh, you know, that, that might uh, have used the same resources. You know, the resource report information, again, gets put into these authentication reports. Uh, which helps with the authentication plans. And then, you know, the fair data services are really once the experiment, um, you know, has been uh, completed, you know, how can I actually publish my data, uh, you know, in a, in a data repository, you know, the discovery portal connecting researchers to the broader biomedical community and, and the information resources that are available and the hypothesis center, you know, to enable resource, re researchers to really harness power of some of this big data that's out there without the need, you know, for, uh, you know, deep bioinformatics expertise if one wants to explore, uh, you know, how, uh, for example, uh, the data um, relates genes to pathways uh, and to uh, uh, other aspects. So I think uh, that is, you know, the end, you know, we want really people to uh, get involved in the DKNet community. You know, so we do have, you know, a, a webinar series that is uh, running, you know, where we provide information on various tools, various resources available to the community. And we record these webinars and they're available on our YouTube channel. So that's another good resource. Uh, we have a newsletter, you know, where we, you know, monthly send out information about new resources that are available to researchers, new funding opportunities. Um, so again, that's a, a, a good resource. Uh, uh, for investigators, you know, and then, you know, we have, uh, you know, our Twitter feed and other uh, community news where we provide information about other, you know, community activities that, that may be happening. And uh, at the end of this presentation, you know, all the different areas that we, uh, uh, we introduced, you know, there are links to all these uh, different uh, available resources uh, that you can also uh, uh, use. So uh, that's the end of uh, my presentation. Um, so just wanted to thank everyone.